All right, now we're going to talk about long QT syndrome. There's a lot to get through for this, and I'll try and make it brief. First of all, what is a long QT? The quick way to measure it is to look at the distance between the, the RR interval and see if the T-way finishes at or about halfway between that interval. If it does, the patient probably has a prolonged QT interval. The other thing to look at is just the general morphology, these long sloping T waves. If you see those, you've got to think about a potential long QT. That's the quick way. In the exam, you may need to know uh, that there's different formulas you can use. You won't be expected to actually calculate a QT interval manually because you need a calculator to do it because you have to do square roots and things. But don't forget to look up in the top left corner of the ECG and you'll often see the QT and the QTC. QTC is a QT interval that's been corrected for the rate. And uh, I'll just show you some, uh, an example of how that's calculated. So this graph shows you how QT changes with rate. And the general concept is that as your heart rate goes up, QT interval goes down and vice versa. So you'll notice that people have more prolonged QT intervals at slower heart rates. And it's not uncommon to get a question where a patient is going in and out of torsades and in between they have a sinus bradycardia with a long QT. So we've got a sinus bradycardia with a long QT. And if they're going in and out of torsades, the treatment is increase the rate. Obviously treat the underlying cause, treat any toxic ingestions, etc., etc. But in the short term, if you increase the rate, you're going to shorten the QT interval and make it less likely that they're going to go in and out of torsades. You can see there's different formulas here you can apply. It's probably worth looking up to know the theory behind them for the exam, but I wouldn't spend too much time practicing calculating a corrected QT. This is just another example of an ECG with a long QT. If you look here in, say, lead one, you can see that calculate, you know, look at the RR interval and then look where the T wave finishes, and it's probably just beyond halfway. So that's probably a long QT. It's tricky because the rate's faster in this one. So just don't forget about it, even if it doesn't, the, in the exam, the patient may not be bradycardic, and uh, you need to just keep your wits about you. Always go right through your P, QRS, ST and uh, T wave changes and at the end of the when you think you have finished that always remember to go back and double check the QT interval. Just quickly as well what is too long for a QT? Generally it's said that uh, because it varies with rate it is variable but for your average adult they say greater than about 450 is probably pathological. If you see a QT greater than 500 then it's most likely going to be abnormal and if you get more than 550 to 600, you need to start getting very worried about that patient and uh, start implementing some treatment to shorten their QT and uh, treat uh, any underlying cause. And on that note, we'll just talk quickly about the causes of a long QT syndrome. The first and uh, easiest to remember cause is the hypos. Hypo anything. So hypothermia hypothyroid and then the electrolytes hypokalemia, hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia all can give you a prolonged QT. The next thing to remember is that ischemia or infarction can cause just about any ECG problem so if your patient's having an AMI they can get a long QT from that. The patient's unconscious it might be that they've got a raised intracranial pressure, can prolong your QT. There's a huge list of drugs. In fact, there's entire websites dedicated to the drugs that can prolong your QT. And we'll talk about those in a moment. And lastly, there's congenital causes. They're rare, but still you need to think about it if you've excluded everything else. Remember in the exam, they love toxicology. You're going to get tox questions. So get an ECG with a long QT. It's always worth mentioning drugs, so we'll go on now to talk about some of the drugs that can prolong your QT. So the long QT drugs are pretty easy to remember. 
it's a ridiculous list uh, if you just look at it from a textbook, but a good way to group them is that it's all of the anti-drugs. Of course, the first one we think of is anti-arrhythmics. And the commonest ones that prolong your QT are sodium channel blockers, amiodarone, and sotalol. And the prolonged QT and torsades from sotalol is greater in women, more common in females. Other anti-drugs are the anti-psychotics, so things like haloperidol, and we all know there's been a lot of controversy around droperidol and the black box labelling of that. If you don't know about that, you need to look it up and know about it. Uh, but that's the reason it was banned, was because of the QT prolonging effects, which there is uh, a lot of argument about. Uh, other anti-drugs are anti depressants. And I'm writing like a psych patient at the moment myself. Like I'm on some of these drugs. Uh, antihistamines can also do it. Antibiotics and the classic class of antibiotics that causes a prolonged QT are the macrolides. So things like erythro erythromycin and azithromycin. There's many others, but uh, it's worth knowing some examples of those. And another um, class to remember is the anti-addiction drugs, and of those, methadone is a good one to remember because that can prolong your QT as well. The next ECG is the second, de second degree Mabitz type 2 ECG. Again, if you're not feeling switched on, you might just think this is a sinus bradycardia and that these little double bumps here are something to do with uh, a funny shape in the T wave. Most people who have some ECG experience though will be able to pick that there's a P wave followed by a QRS. That's the T wave. And then there's a P wave without a corresponding QRS. So you get P wave, QRS, P wave, no QRS, P wave, QRS, P wave, no QRS. So that's a two to one a bits type 2 second degree heart block and these patients are at risk for degenerating into complete heart block and they uh, need to get admitted and will usually have a pacemaker inserted. Remember this is different to the wanky back which is a gradually lengthening PR interval and uh, that which is a benign condition. This one has a fixed PR interval and every second or third beat so it can be two to one, three to one, four to one, so every second, third or fourth beat won't be conducted. The next ECG can be a bit tricky. This should actually say left anterior fascicular block, LAFB. So a bifascicular block, remember your heart's conducting system. If you recall, you've got your atrial internodal tracts, your bundle of his, your right bundle, then your left bundle which splits into an anterior fascicle and a posterior fascicle. And that's the first, second, and third fascicles of your conducting system. So if you have a bifascicular block, if you either take out your right bundle and one of your corresponding left fascicles, you're going to get a bifascicular block. If you take out all three, you're going to have a trifascicular block, which is bad. So on the ECG of the bifascicular block, what you're looking for, and this is again a quick way to do this for exam situations only, I'd encourage you to go back and read up about the physiology behind this. You're looking for a right bundle branch block and a left axis deviation. If you see that in a patient with syncope, the point of the question is going to be that it's a bifascicular block and uh, yeah, you need to be able to pick it. The other type of bifascicular block you can get, which I've already mentioned, is, and it's been well nicely arrowed here for you, is the same thing. You see a right bundle branch block and a right axis deviation, then it's, uh, again, it's a bifascicular block. In a patient with syncope, that's bad, they get admitted. Don't send them home with this ECG. It can be a little bit tricky to remember uh, the difference between a, uh, a left anterior and a left posterior fascicular block. And the way I remember it is that left axis deviation will give you a left anterior fascicular block, LA.
LA, whereas a right axis deviation will give you a posterior fascicular block, and that's because P and R are close together in the alphabet. LA and LA, if you see either of these with a right bundle branch block, then it's a bifascicular block. This is just a little bit of trivia for you. Technically, a left bundle branch block is also a bifascicular block because you've blocked out your two left fascicles. Practically, uh, bifascicular blocks that are just a left bundle tend not to lead to syncope, but it's worth just keeping that in mind that it's as a technicality, left bundle branch is a type of bifascicular block because your left anterior fascicle and your left posterior fascicle are both kaput. Probably more useful to remember for the exam, it's not really pertinent to this session, that uh, other things, they want you to know other things about left bundle branch block, and namely the Scarbosa criteria, which help you differentiate this huge amount of T wave inversion and ST elevation from uh, between a left bundle branch block and an acute myocardial infarction. I'm not going to go into that in this session, we can save that for another time but uh, it's worth knowing Scarbosa criteria. Lastly, the last ECG you don't want to miss, and this actually came up in my exam in the 2009.1 uh, written exam. It was the first question, I think. It was uh, this ECG in an elderly patient with syncope, and if you'd practiced these before and knew this list, you couldn't miss it. I think the pass rate was around 30% for this exam because clearly people hadn't studied this ECG. The trick is, right bundle branch block, left axis deviation, and a first degree heart block. So if you see the combination of those three, right bundle branch block, left axis deviation, you know, possibly you get it with a right axis deviation as well because that still counts as a bifascicular block, and a first degree heart block, that combination is a trifascicular block. These patients are at high risk for going to complete heart block. And they need a pacemaker. So don't send them home. So there you have it. That's the, if you miss it, they die ECGs. And just quickly to go through it again, we've looked at Brugada syndrome, Wolf Parkinson White, Hokum or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, long QT, second degree Mabitz type two, and trifascicular block. If you've got any questions or you think I've missed something or made a mistake or you don't agree with the list or you think there's a, an ECG that I haven't got on there that should be on there, uh, feel free to write in. Uh, the, my email address is andy at edexam.com.au and uh, I hope you found this useful. And of course there's other ECGs that you shouldn't miss in the exam but they're usually less life-threatening and more uh, if you miss it, the patient gets sick, or if you miss it, you fail the question, which aren't quite as serious as sending people home with these ECGs. Uh, I'll do those in another session coming up soon, but uh, for now, go back, write this list out, stick it on a mirror in your bathroom, stick some pictures up of these ECGs around your house so you get to know them inside out, and uh, you won't miss them on exam day. Good luck.